Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Alatine, Alanon, and fellow AAs, I'm Dick, and I'm an alcoholic. And I want to draw your attention to the program a, a moment. They, they say that I, I'm a speaker and I'm supposed to uh, talk on uh, withholding fears or handling fears. And uh, I'm not a speaker. I don't think I ever want to be. But uh, I'll uh, do what I can. And uh, as far as handling fears are concerned, well, I, uh, I don't think I ever did. I tried to handle them, I talked of them, and I moaned to everybody who would listen. And when I finally learned to get at the cause of my fears, the fears trying uh, sort of subscribe it, certainly to uh, a manageable level. Uh, I also want to make a, a point right now, uh, whatever I say up here is strictly my opinion. I don't wish to change anybody's opinion or influence anybody to do anything they uh, normally I may or may not want to do and uh, whatever I say uh, will be whatever the AA program has taught me and undoubtedly uh, based on what a little bit of time and observation uh, finding out what works and what don't work. Uh, I haven't the foggiest idea what I'm going to talk about but somewhere along the line and I believe it was read tonight that if we talk about uh, what I was like what happened and what I'm like now, you can't go too far wrong. And uh, so if I was talking about what I was like, I, I don't believe or don't agree on drunk alarms. I don't think they're of any value to anybody. I, I, I think they may be entertaining, and, uh, but there's very little therapeutic value in it. And so you'll get very little drunk along out of me. I uh, always disliked and uh, I go to a group and and uh, they'll talk about uh, how much they drank and how many cars they wrecked and how many times they were in jail. And the next one talks about the same thing, only even in jail three times more. And for uh, throw in a few cop chases and a t- few times off the cliff. And uh, then they say they've had a good meeting. And in my opinion, all they have done is pool their misery. Because unless, unless we talk about the 12 steps and find out how we what we're made of, and what we got to do about it, there's going to be no change. Now, having said that, I uh, do think I've got to tell a few things, or at least a couple points of my past. Uh, neither of them are drinking stories, but in my case, I am certain that they set the table for what happened to me later, and that is a life of alcoholism. And I go back to the prairies where I was born and raised in my dad's farm, uh, run right up again the international boundary, and because it did, we was quite isolated out there. The nearest town in one direction was 18, and the other one was about 15, and so we lived in a sort of a neighborhood by ourselves. And uh, in that area and in that time, uh, we had a, a movement. I don't know whether it was religious or what it was, but they called themselves the Holy Rollers, and they were well named. They'd holler and shout and paw the ground, and, and I can remember one instance. Uh, I was at and very young. Uh, I don't suppose I'd be over six or seven. And uh, at one of these rallies or revivals or whatever they called them, and there was two jokers there, uh, old men to me, but uh, maybe they weren't so old when you're only six, seven, everybody over 30 is 90. And so maybe they weren't so old, but, but I remember them. They were down on their knees and they had their arms around each other and they was pawing the dirt and... And, uh, and straw, and uh, I was looking at them bung-eyed and uh, scared to death. And I had never forgot. I was, had a, we had a family reunion not to, any more than a year, year and a half ago, and uh, we were reminiscing about this particular time, and as we grew older, we used to play jokes on these characters, and, uh, and uh, one particular time, we was, we lived in the Seward Valley, and the, the Seward River run right, right by there. And uh, a lot of them had to, this is back in the horse and buggy days, incidentally, and uh, a lot of them had to cross the, that water after their service or whatever it was. And, and uh, we took the, the, the nuts off the, off the wagon, off the buggy wheel. 
And uh, they get into, the, get into the river there, a couple of them, and of course, whenever the water get up a little bit high, why, the wheels floated off. And we was uh, reminiscing about this, and uh, as an old friend of mine, he, he's a year or two older than I was, and, and uh, maybe I shouldn't, but I'll tell you his exact words. He said, uh, I can still remember them old goats standing up in the seat trying to keep their arses dry, and you should have heard them yodeling to the Lord. <laughs> get them out of that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was that. In that area, we, we had, as I said, no outside source, and they decided they would uh, start a Sunday school for us young heathens, and, and they uh, uh, got a Sunday school going, and, and the same type of people was the ministers, and I can remember one Sunday that uh, he was extra loud, and he hammered and stamped and roared around there, and uh, just after the service, uh, in drove two mounties in full uniform and red coats and a nice kid standing around, never seen these guys before. And they arrested our minister for smuggling. And uh, from that time, I, I said, if that's religion, you keep it. And I don't believe that I was ever in a church other than maybe a, a funeral or a wedding until after I grew up. And the other thing that I wanted to mention that I did grow up, at least physically, and uh, I joined the service. And uh, I was in air crew, uh, air force, and then air crew, and then on bomber command. And uh, as time went on, well, I got over dropping bombs over in Europe and got shot down and was taken prisoner. I'm sketchy here because uh, what I got to say got nothing to do with this. But anyway, I was taken a, uh, as prisoner over in Czechoslovakia, or at least that's where they took us. And uh, things were grim, but not quite as grim as they got. Uh, when the Russians started to advance, they wouldn't let us fall into Russians' hands, so uh, they kept us walking ahead of them. And uh, things got real rough. There was no food, no shelter, no nothing. And uh, I can say that, uh, well, we started with roughly 18,000 men, and we ended up with less than five or 6,000. And uh, after a month, a heavy toll. The guys were dying, and, and I can remember we was always outside, and it was right in the dead of winter. And I can remember some mornings we get up or sometimes, but never morning, just whenever they wanted us to move, they moved us. And there was lots of times when you could see bodies laying there half covered with snow. And uh, sometimes I thought there was more stayed there than get up. But uh, anyway, I survived. And I let it go with that. And I thought uh, that was all there was to it. I might add that... Uh, I still stayed in the service a couple of years after that, and uh, and uh, I used to drink a little heavy, and uh, one guy made a remark about me drinking too much, and uh, another fellow said, uh, well, if you've been through what he'd been through, uh, you drink too. And I just loved it. Got a lot of free booze out of that, too, incidentally. And so I didn't know it then, but I know now that I had more hate and resentment and self-pity in me, they're choking off. And so when you have uh, no spiritual upbringing at all, like I did, and you enter adulthood as full of self-pity and resentment as I did, you can see about where it led me, and it did. And I, as I said, I won't go into no drunk along, but I do remember trying to sober up on my last drunk. And... Uh, I was sitting in a cafe one morning and I was trying to hold a cup of coffee with with both hands and it was slopping over my fingers and a guy was sitting beside me, whether he was there or whether he saw me and moved there, I don't know. But uh, he said, and I never forgot his words, he said, I used to do that, but I don't have to do that anymore. And I never let on, I heard him, but I heard him. And I watched out of the corner of my eye uh, to see where he went and he just went across the street. And I don't know whether it's a half an hour or an hour and a half. I went over and I, I said to him, what do you mean? And uh, he was a barber and he was cutting the guy's hair at that time. So he he uh, phoned the guy and uh, a fellow come in to see me. And uh, I don't see him here, but uh, he could be. And uh, he talked to me for, I have no idea, an hour or three hours. I got no idea. I don't remember anything he said either. Some of what he said might have stuck in my mind for a day or two or an hour or two. But I remember the last thing he said. He said, you go home and don't drink. And he said, we'll come and pick you up on Wednesday night. And that was on the, uh, Monday morning. And the stay uh, no drinking on Monday was uh, 
No problem, because I was closer to dead than alive anyway, and Tuesday wasn't much better. But by Wednesday, I was back in the driver's seat, and I was thinking about going to this meeting, and I guess I made up my mind to go or not to go two dozen times that day. And finally, uh, I, I decided I wouldn't go. And I had the conversation all figured out, you know, and I, when they asked me to, if I was going to go, I was going to say no, and I had a reason. Uh, look, sound reasonable to me, anyhow. And so they did come, and uh, he opened the door, and he didn't say nothing. So he had, they asked me to come before my recitation was any good, and uh, I never said nothing. He didn't say nothing, and pretty soon he said, get in. And away went my prepared speech, and I get in, and I went to my first meeting. And, and I'll never forget that. I, I, I went down to that meeting, and I, I thought, this is the end of the road. What in the world is happening? Me down there with a bunch of drunks. And, and, and I get into that meeting, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't feel worse, I'm sure of it. And you know, God works in mysterious ways. They, they must have knew they caught a real live one, and so the, the meeting was full. And we couldn't find a seat to go right around to the back. And a dozen times in that first meeting, I'd get up and left, but I'd had to get up and walk past anybody, and I didn't have the nerve. I didn't have much in those days unless I had a couple of belts, and so I didn't have any for three days, and so I sit there. And uh, I'll never forget another thing in that first meeting. Uh, I suppose they must have mentioned the Lord uh, higher power or something. Uh, anyway, I caught all that, and at the end, uh, they get up, and, and repeated the Lord's Prayer. And, and, and I thought, now I know. A bunch of Bible thumping so and so, you know, I ain't gonna have no part of this. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't get up. And so everybody else got up and, and held hands and I sit there. And uh, the boys, they knew that they had a real one, I guess. And so they took me someplace every night. And I don't know, I say 30 days, but it could have been 40, I don't know. And lots of times that I just told them to go to pop, but they just said, get in. And I didn't have no booze and no, ba no guts, and so I get in. And, and anyway, they kept me dry, and all of this time I wouldn't get up for the Lord's Prayer. And I'll never forget those guys. They, would, they always held hands, and, 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 and the, the two on each side of me, they never joined hands. They just held them out like this. And finally, the agony of... I was sitting there, got worse than the agony of getting up. And so I finally get up and held her hands. And I didn't know it then, but I know now my therapy had begun. Why? It was because I was doing something that I didn't believe in, didn't want to do, hated doing, but doing it anyway. And that's the way our whole program works. You see, they, they, they wanted me to admit in that first step that I was an alcoholic. And no way, I wasn't an alcoholic. An alcoholic to me was Skid Row Bum. No home, no job, no nothing, and that's an alcoholic. And me, I had this and I had that, and uh, you ain't an alcoholic, you got those things. And uh, so I wouldn't say I was an alcoholic. And finally, you people showed me I was an alcoholic. And I learned by you people talking, and I, I and you, you'd say something, and I'd think, oh my God, that's the way I feel too. And little by little, I learned I was an alcoholic. And then I could say I was an alcoholic. You see, I learned uh, that an alcoholic is not a skid row bum. An alcoholic is anybody where alcohol interferes with your health, your job, your health, or your home life. You're an alcoholic. And uh, uh, I had a job, and I had a home, and uh, health was pretty good, but things around the house could be better, you know, quite by my fault. You know, I've already to shut up and put on dishes and this type of thing. My things would be all right. But anyway, I could uh, give a little measure of doubt there. And uh, little by little, I learned I was an alcoholic. And uh, and I wouldn't say it, of course, but I could see that you guys is fitting me too close. When I when I first heard you people saying those stories, I thought my, my wife was around telling, talking about me. And then I got thinking, well, I never told her either. And so then I figured that you know, maybe it's genuine, and, and maybe maybe I am an alcoholic, and so I could uh, I could uh, sort of come to grips with that. But then when we got to the, the second step, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, restore me to sanity. Anyway, I can't think of the first words of it. 
uh, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And, and, and you know, I thought about that for a little while. And, you know, to be restored to, that meant you departed from. Uh, you people hurt my feelings. You made me mad, you know. Uh, you see, I, I sobered up in, in, in a city that has Canada's largest mental institution. And my work on occasion would take me over there. And, hey, them, them people were nuts. You know, you mean to say I'm like that? You know, I, I didn't know at that time that about half of those people over there had fried their brains with booze and drugs of all sorts. And and so I wouldn't come to grips with that either. You know, I, I'm not, you know, restoring me to sanity as an insult. And so I, I, I used to, in those days, I used to think well, I had to walk with my head thrown over my shoulder because I was always walking on the lip. But I, I didn't, I didn't think I was an alcoholic and I wasn't insane. And of course, step three, this max of religion, I wasn't going to have anything to do with that. And at about that time, uh, we had a, a, a little minister. Uh, he was a pastor of a church over 40, 50 miles out. And uh, he asked permission if he could come to a meeting or two to help his congregation. I guess he must have had a drunk or two out there too. I don't know. But anyway, he come and, uh, and he kept steady for two years. And he often said, he said, I came to help my congregation, but I stayed to help myself. And of course, uh, like in the two years that uh, that he was there, uh, I got to know him well, and occasionally I'd drive out and talk to him, and, and uh, I, I wouldn't have anything to do with the first three steps, but I knew that you had to do a little action on four. And so he got me going on that. And of course, a uh, typical alcoholic attitude, I had to make a good job of this, you know. And so I remember uh, writing... Uh, you know, uh, my fourth step. And I tear it and I write it and I tear pages up and write again. I, you know, I just couldn't do anything but a perfect job. And uh, finally, I, I took that out to him and uh, and uh, uh, he read this or we went through it together and I took my first fifth step with him. Uh, a pitiful at, uh, attempt. But it was the best I could do at that time. And that, that's what I've always learned. They always say when they hey, go with what you got. That drunk along. And my fourth step was nothing more than a drunk along. But that's all I knew. I didn't have any idea in those days that a fourth step is not really so much what you've done, but why you've done it. That's what we're digging for. And uh, I had no knowledge like that. So I had made some sort of a beginning. And uh, uh, as time went on, why... Uh, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get out of the driver's seat. You see, I, I would get these highs that they have in AA, you know, up two, three days, and and then I'd fall off in the doggone depressions you ever imagined, and uh, I stayed there for weeks, and I could never understand why that was, and uh, I know now why. You see, if you're like me, I didn't come to AA because I wanted to. I come because there was no place else to go. I had been to psychiatrists and marriage counselors and ministers and, and nothing was wrong with what they said. I, I, I just couldn't apply. And, and I was in a real dilemma. In those days, uh, I still thought you should be able to figure this thing out. And uh, I didn't know in those days we don't have an intellectual problem. We have an emotional problem over which the intelligence has mighty little control. And I can tell you something, the emotions have a lot of control over the intelligence. That is why I would, in spite of myself, I would say, never again, that's it, I'll never drink again. And in two hours, two days, or two weeks, I would do exactly the same thing with the same regret and remorse that I had the time before. And uh, all it does, it done was just cause more fear and insecurity. And I had no idea... Uh, I know now that I've been full of fear all my life, and I, even long before I had a drink. And the book tells us that fear and insecurity, that we believe is the root of our problem. Now, if that's the root of my problem as an alcoholic, what does that do? It makes me self-centered. And if I'm self-centered, that means I'm selfish. And that means, uh, as an alcoholic, I never get enough out. If I got it, I didn't want it or it was not right, or something. And I'd throw it away and go after something else. I, it was, wasn't the things I wanted. I wanted some peace of mind and didn't have it. And I had no idea this was the problem. And so, uh, you 
come, and I'll say this probably several times up here, you come and you keep coming. And if, if you're like me, in spite of it, yourself, it'll work. You see, just like, just like, uh, when I stood up to hold hands in that first Lord's Prayer, I had to do something I didn't want to do. And the whole program is like that. And you see, uh, about this time, you know, I go into these great depressions and I'd moan to anybody who was listening. I talked to my sponsor, uh, what do you do? How do you get out of it? Well, he said, you're going to have to let go. And I'd never let go of my life. I knew what happened when people let go. And I'll get back to that march across Europe there and the men that who let go died. And the men who didn't let go made and so you wanted me to let go here, and I ain't gonna. I just ain't gonna. And so I struggled to figure this thing out. And nowhere in our program does it ask us to figure out anything. It don't ask us to understand anything. It just says accept and apply. And when you have done that, then you'll understand what you've done. And until then, you won't. And so... I, I can remember these, these depressions and I, I would stay in them so long, you know, and I, I get so that uh, I, I couldn't sleep. And I got thinking after four or five years in the program, well, I tried AA and it ain't working. I know now that I was learning to talk talk, but I wasn't learning nothing about walking the walk. And I can remember my old sponsor, you know, uh, he'd been around quite, you know, quite a few years in those days, and he said, well, you've got to pray. And pray no way. Well, he said, I learned that I knew, I found out that I had to. And I don't think I believed in it too much either. And I wouldn't do that. You know, and uh, and so it went on for months. And I got the idea, well, I, I've tried AA. And you know something, i, I got to say it here, that I thought more of suicide in AA, sober, than I ever did before I got here. You see, I came to AA, AA expecting to find something, and there was nothing there. Just nothing there. And I know now why. Because I was talking the talk, and I wouldn't do the things that I, I was asked, the program asked me to do. And I, I would sit there and, and do them. I had to understand. You see, all my life I had been taught, you go to school, you get a diploma, then you get this, and you can earn that, and you can get in charge. And in AA, they, they say that ain't so. You do as the program asks. You've got to get out of the driver's seat. And uh, to give in to this type of thing, I was so full of fear, uh, I, I wouldn't do that. I also know that that same fear saved my life because I was beat in the AA program. And I know that I'd uh, quit. But I think back to those days and I knew what happened to the guys that quit. And so I couldn't leave AA, and I couldn't get AA, and I was in a trip dilemma. And I can remember my old sponsor, you know, he he would say, well, you got to pray. And I wouldn't pray. But about four or five years, you see, I got to the point where I couldn't sleep. And I remember walking around the table one night, three or four o'clock in the morning, and uh, I thought of what he said. And so I went into the bathroom and I locked the door and I didn't turn the light on and I got down on my knees and I, I can remember to this day the goose quills that stuck out of my legs and I, I was just, you know, and I'm sure I didn't say anything. And I thought that after this tremendous effort what I'd be relieved of something. And I know now what happened. You see, I was finally driven to my knees. It had nothing to do with spirituality. And I finally learned, too, that my attempts at prayer, uh, I can remember my sponsor and I asked him, hey, are you praying? I said, yep. Are uh, you regular? Yep. Yeah. Of course, I would do it Monday and then next Thursday and miss a week and then do it three times one day, you know. And uh, I couldn't get on to it. But little by little, I finally did. I had to learn that praying had nothing to learning to pray has nothing to do with spirituality. It is exactly like standing up and holding those hands. I had to do something whether I believed it or not. And getting down on your knees and trying to say something, I was just mumbling, I don't remember saying whatever I said, I have no idea. But the act was what was happening. And what was happening. You see, every time I'd done some of this, 
some of that pride of the alcoholic was being butchered, being destroyed, and then there was room for something else to move in. And our whole program is like that. If you do the things that the program asks, and you will lower that pride or destroy that pride in you, then you become teachable. And little by little, I was doing this, and after a while, uh, I would pray a little oftener, and, and, and Ernie would say, well, uh, are you praying? And I'd say, yep. Yeah. And he'd, every once in a while, he'd ask that, and every once in a while, I'd make a little effort and pray a little harder and a little oftener, and, and one day, I got praying on a regular basis took seven, eight years, but I finally got to. And then I thought, now wait till he asked me again. And you know, he never did. It took me two years to figure that out. He didn't have to. You could see by my attitude that I was doing. And you see it become apparent. You see the the, elk, the, the person so afflicted is the last to know. And that was the, road, the way it was on the road in, and it was the way uh, it is on the way out, or the way up. Uh, how you, how you, you word it how you like. And I, I was getting better and I didn't know it. And, uh, so I, I got, once, once I become a little teachable and started to do these things, then I was being forced out of the driver's seat. And I was starting to do things, uh, uh, more or less automatically. And, and I, as I said, I came and kept coming and in spite of me, it started to work. And little by little, uh, things started to change. And uh, uh, as, time, as time went on, why well, I could do these things. And, and, and then you see, uh, made a list of all persons you had harmed and became willing to make amends. You know, uh, man, oh man, you know, uh, this this was just the same thing all over again. I, I, I'm going to use the phrase Aunt Nellie because it's fictitious, of course. But I didn't get along with her. It could be your mother-in-law or anyone else. And uh, I had to go and apologize to her. And uh, I was just in, in, in stitches. Uh, what would she think? And old Ernie told me, it don't matter what she thinks. It's not her that's sick. It's you. And I couldn't understand that. And what's the use of apologizing to somebody if they ain't going to accept it? But you see, me going and doing something that I didn't think I should do or needed to do. I had to lose pride to do it. And then they be, when I done it, there was little room, a little more pride dead, a little more room for things to roll in. And little by little, uh, that my attitude changed. And I have no idea when things started to change. I just learned after a period of time that, uh, funny, I hadn't thought of that before. You know, uh, something that used to really send me up on arms, it just didn't, didn't, didn't happen anymore. I have no idea when it happened. Uh, when it changed, it just changed. And you see, that's what I said in the beginning here uh, about handling your fears. I never handled my fears. The more I tried to handle my fears, the worse they got. And when I get out of the driver's seat and tried to get at the cause of my fears, the fears slowly disappeared. I didn't have the fears. I'm sure I can say now that my fears are down to normal level. Uh, alcoholics uh, didn't invent any of these... Uh, defects, and so we're not going to be 100% cured, but it's only when they get out of hand that they're a problem. And so I uh, I, I know now that, 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 that all the listed defects of character, resentment, anger, self-pity, intolerance, we can talk about them until we're green in the face and change nothing. Unless we get at the cause of why I'm full of anger, why am I jealous, why I'm in intolerance. You see, all of this generally is the result of the problem. And the problem is fear and insecurity, lack of self-worth. And uh, you know those things. And so you do the things that the program asks you to do, and your self-worth, your, se your self-esteem is being returned. And then these things don't, a don't bother you like they used to. And suddenly these things just are no longer a problem. And I, I still... Uh, uh, have a sort of a tongue-in-cheek attitude when you go to meetings and let's say, they'll say, well, let's talk about resentment tonight. You can talk about resentment till you're green in the eyes and change nothing. You talk about why you're resentful and do something about that and the resentment will just disappear one day. And so I think the whole concept 
of, uh, of, the, of the program is not the way I feel, it's, it's how I feel that way. And so when we work at the cause of our problem and get away from these results that are so obvious to each of us, and we think that if I could do something about my insecurity or if I can do something about my anger, things are going to help. They're not. If I don't find the cause of my anger and my resentments, my insecurity is going to stay there. And you know, I know now and I've said already that fear and insecurity lack a self-worth. And you do these things that the program asks and little by little you build up your self-esteem. You can walk in this world, you know, as good as, but no better than any other human being alive. And that was a completely different feeling. I came to AA expecting almost anything in the world except that. I thought that you people was going to teach me how to drink or how to do something. I had no idea. But it turned out so very different. So we look, we work at the cause of the problem and forget about why I feel the way I do. And you know, uh, you know, you hear lots of speakers stand up here, you know, and say, you know, there's no guarantees in AA. Uh, you don't know who's going to get it and who ain't. And, and I disagree with that. I am absolutely satisfied that there's two guarantees in AA. One, the first one is you're guaranteed to get it if you work the program. And two, you're guaranteed not to if you don't. And we can fool ourselves for a long, long time. And so I sit in AA and hurt, and I sure didn't want to. I had no idea what was bothering me. Finally, I was forced to do the things necessary to make me well. There was nothing I'd done willingly, or nothing I wanted to do. But when I hurt worse, bad enough to it, it was worse than doing the things that make me well, then I'd done it. Very hesitantly, but I'd done it. And little by little, things changes. And what changes in the end? Nothing but the six inches between the ears, your attitude and your self-worth. And when that's changed, uh, that's all there is to change. You ain't going to get rich and you ain't going to get very smart. I, I sure can't claim any uh, claim to either one. Here I was uh, sitting with a, uh, the best program that ever was written right at my fingertips. And it took me 10, 12, 14 years to get it through a quarter of an inch skull can't claim very much intelligence on that score. And, uh, but you, you do get contentment and peace of mind. And uh, uh, how it works, I think that just about sums it up. So we come now to, a, to the place where, uh, what I'm like now. And uh, it's hard to sum it up. I always, when it comes to summing it up, I, I got to refer to the Father John Doe. Now, he was a uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, 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 one of the foremost authors and lecturers of AA who ever existed. And uh, if some of you people don't know who he is, he was the first Catholic priest that was in AA. And uh, back in those days, why uh, uh, the bishops thought that, that their, their fathers didn't drink. And so every time a poor old uh, John got into trouble, why, they throw him in the mental hospital. And then that man had been thrown in nine different mental institutions. And in one of them, he had been declared absolutely hopeless. And during this time, he'd been derobed. At least he, the, the, the power to, to preach was taken away from him. Uh, the uh, right to own or drive a car for the rest of his life was taken away from him. And after we come out of one of these mental institutions, they'd sort of cast around and see which church would take old John. And finally, one of them would say, well, we'll try to take John. And in one of these, he got, he got to a, a minister and one of the, one of the congressmen or one of the uh, church members, can't think of the right word, uh, knew something about AA. And he overheard him talking to another man. And uh, he said, and in his books, he said, naturally, being interested when somebody talks about alcohol, I, I, I listen. And... Uh, he learned that they, it was an alcoholic and they would do something for him if he come to a meeting. And, and old Ralph, uh, old John said, uh, well, maybe I'll go along. Or maybe I can help those poor devils out. And so he went and he rose from there to one of the foremost lecturers in the, the States, or AA has ever uh, produced it, in my opinion. And he wrote uh, 
Sobriety Without End, Sobriety and Beyond, the 14 Golden Books. She had 34 records out. Uh, that was before the uh, A-Tracks and the cassettes were invented. And I had all the records. And he was telling his story at the end uh, of one of his speeches. And a lady came up to him and she said, how could you do that? And he, uh, his answer to her made my hair stand, stand on end when I first heard it. He said, I didn't do anything. God did it all. And here at this particular time, I was practically sweating dry, dry blood trying to stay sober and try to get the program, and I didn't appreciate it. And uh, now I know exactly what he means. How can I uh, take any credit for what happened to me? I had no idea what needed to be done. So now I can say in all sincerity, I didn't do anything. God did it all. And uh, that's about sums it up. Now, yeah, I'd like to say a word to, to the, the new people or, or, or the nearly new people. And they came to AA as I did and expecting to, uh, you know, get something out of it. And uh, for the first few days, you know, you can uh, remember where you were last night and, uh, and eat a little bit and sleep a little bit and get through a door without banging both sides and so uh, things are better. But after a period of time, that falls off. And if you're like me, you get into some sort of a depression. And uh, I think there's a reason for that. You and I are an alcoholic. Seem to have a constitution that we got to learn something the hard way. And uh, we didn't come to AA because we wanted to. And we're not going to learn anything because we want to. We're going to learn because we have to. And so that's why we fall into these depressions. It's time to look for answers. You see, when you and I are on that high, we don't need any help, man. We're just dancing along with their toes hardly touching the ground. And, uh, and I believe there's a reason for that. I believe that God gives us a tiny glimpse of what the program can be like. But something for nothing is worth nothing, and our program is priceless. And so you're not going to get it easy. You're going to get it through sweat and tears. And so you go off, you fall off, and you go into these depressions, and you, what you're doing down there is you're looking for answers, but only when you're hurting will you be looking. And little by little, like me, you will learn to follow directions. And little by little, you'll come out of the fog. And I, 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 I think that new people are told that, that there is a price to pay You've only paid a portion, a part of it when you come to AA. You're going to get the answers because you see, in my book, this program is priceless. It saved my life and none of, and none of us have any more than one. We don't have too many to kick around. And so, you're here now. For God's sake, don't loop, don't loaf. You have the opportunity. None need not fail. You come and you keep coming. And little by little. And, and and I gotta add something there, on a regular basis. And I say a regular basis because that gets hard after a while. Everybody can come to a few meetings, but after a period of time when we ain't get no great joy out of a meeting, it becomes old hat. And the self-discipline necessary for to come to a meeting when there's a show we'd like to see, or we've got friends, or we got visitors, that's the thing that we got to overcome. There is nothing more important in your life and your well-being and use it like that. And you haven't a friend that won't be behind you 100% if he happens to come. And you tell him, look, i got to go. And they, they'll understand that. Well, I, I, I hope that uh, uh, I've said something that will help somebody stay in here one more day or come to one more meeting or try to understand something just a little bit different or, or see things in a little different way. And if I've done that, my efforts is worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.